All right. Okay. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 292 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears, and I'm, I'm going to be real, okay? We're going hard with the fit today. In terms of in terms of uh, me being in my slut era, we are going hard today, okay? We've got, the, we've got the unnecessary little bracelet here, quite feminine, woman's bracelet. There's a tip for all you fellas out there. If you want to embrace your slut era, Era. It's all about women's jewelry. Uh, we've got the we've got the the polo shirt that kind of doesn't really fit me in the sleeves because I'm so fucking long. So I just rolled them up. All right, extra slutty activity. Um, and then and then we've got the the pants that are that are unbearably tight now. I actually need to buy a new pair because I've been going to the gym, baby. I've been I've been hitting those heavy deadlifts and heavy squats. All right, and uh, and look. There's, there's no more respectful way to put this. There's no other way to say this. I'm double-cheeked up on a Sunday, okay? My ass has grown heaps. I'm not seeing very much development or progress physically-wise anywhere else in the gym, all right? My lifts are going up, okay? The weight that I'm, that I'm throwing around is getting much, much heavier. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling stronger. I'm healthier, all right? I've got a, I've got a better body... Uh, in in the way that it works, but in terms of actual physical aesthetic appearance, the only development I am noticing is in my ass. It's getting out of control. It's getting too big for my little frame. Okay, I, I haven't. My chest hasn't gotten that much bigger, even though my fucking bench press has gone up heaps. My legs aren't getting that much bigger, even though my squats have gone up. My calves, my arms, my shoulders, nothing is really getting bigger other than my neck and my ass. My neck, my ass, my pussy, and my crack. That's the only thing that I'm really seeing development in is is neck and ass. I've always been known for my strong neck, but I've never really been known but for, for being double-cheeked up on a Sunday. But here we are. That's just how it works today. So welcome to Slut Era Sundays. I'm your host, Lewis Spears, and I'm fully in my slut era, and that's just how it's going to be. The I've stopped listening to all other music, by the way. The only music I listen to now is Ice Spice, She in Her Mood, She a Baddie with Her Baddie Friend. Uh... Um, uh, big, uh, big, big bum and the boobs stay plump or something like that. Okay. And, and while I may not have the big boobs, I, my ass is certainly staying, pl- staying plump. Um, anyway, guys, uh, get your tickets at loosebeers.com Melbourne. If you want to see, uh, me double cheeked up, uh, in, in real life, get your tickets. Now they are selling out the show start in two weeks. Two weeks until the show starts. So get yours now, and we're going to jump straight into this, okay, with a very great headline after I turn on the air conditioner because me just yelling about how my ass is huge is really got get me a little bit hot. Um, so, okay, that's on. All right, now I can read this article. So we're going to kick things off here with this uh, article by Vice. Now, normally I'm not one to bring Vice articles to to the forefront unless it's uh, an article that's been ghostwritten by me via journalist manipulation. Uh, but this one is just great. And I saw this happen live on Twitter, okay? And, and I, I saw this and I was like, what the hell? So Jordan Peterson, right? One of the, one of the, uh, the foremost intellectuals of our age, uh, retweeted a photo of a fetish dick milking website thinking that it was some sort of forced birthing center in China. (laughs) Jordan Peterson, very concerned by milking porn factory. After the internet celebrity psychologist tweeted a fetish porn clip and called it CCP hell, the phrase Chinese dick sucking factory went viral. Now, look, I actually, I like Jordan Peterson most of the time. Most of the time I do like him, but it doesn't matter how smart someone is. This is really important for all of you guys out there and girls out there. It doesn't matter how smart someone is. If they're in their 50s and higher, 
they don't know what the internet is and they never will, okay? You see this all the time with incredibly smart people who generally uh, have quite insightful takes or have really good ideas or innovative ideas. You will always, always, if they are 50 plus, see them believe something fucking insane online or say or do something fucking stupid. This is why you always see politicians, right, who are usually, uh, while not very smart, usually very good with PR and and uh, they're, they're geniuses at being seen to be good people. This is why you always see them fuck up by liking porn on Twitter. Anti-gay politicians who, who for their entire career have never once slipped up and been caught at a fucking gay bar, all of a sudden have 300 plus likes on Twink accounts because they're 50 plus and it doesn't matter how internet savvy they are or how famous online they are, they don't understand the internet. And Jordan Peterson is included in that. Even if you think he's the smartest guy on earth, I I'm telling you right now, this guy's over 50. He doesn't know what the internet is. And that's just reality. And and they never will learn it because they didn't grow up with it. That's the only way they're going to get it. All right? It's millennials and under. They're the only people that truly understand what the internet is. And don't come at me with your Gen X stuff. No one gives a fuck about Gen X. You don't even exist. Psychologist, former professor, and self-help author Jordan Peterson retweeted a fetish video of a penis-milking porn clip on Saturday, seemingly duped into believing that it was footage from inside a Chinese communist sperm extraction factory. And that is just boomer as fuck. See, because, and you know what? Honestly, I think that, that a lot of people are laughing at him for not knowing that this is... Uh, obscenely strange fetish porn. I actually think that I would rather be him in this scenario because when I saw him retweet that, I immediately knew what it was because of what the internet has done to my brain from the age of fucking nine and up. Do you know what I mean? Like, why do I know what that? I've never watched a video of this, but I just uh, have pattern recognition. You know, all how, how the fuck has hundreds of millions of evolutionary uh, toil and advancement, right, gone into fucking pattern recognition that has made human beings, right, the smartest things on, on the planet Earth, potentially in our universe, millions of years of evolution going into pattern recognition so that we can hunt and gather and build and work together and avoid danger. All of that shit is now being used for me to identify fetish porn when I see it. How my ancestors must weep. You know, that's for finding berries, not porn. <laughs> the tweet from user Song Ping Gang who frequently posts supposed videos of Chinese state surveillance, said, what's going on in China? Three children policy? With a clip from a fetish porn shoot of a row of people lying on a table getting their dicks sucked by pumps dangling overhead. <laughs> oh no, they're hooking the Chinese up to the dick sucking machines. What's next? Dude... Let, let's just theoretically, let's step into a world where that's true, right? Where, where China is like, yeah, it's time for forced birth. The population is declining and aging. We need to start forcing dudes to come. I really don't think that this is the most efficient way to do it. You know, like surely you can just have uh, a sperm bank, but with armed guards on the outside. And if you come out with an empty cup, your brains go into it, you know? Although that would give me a bit of performance anxiety, you know? Nut in the cup or we kill your daughter. Well, I don't have a daughter. That's why they're making me do it. Nut in the cup or I kill you. Or your aging mother who's like 150 and she won't fucking die. Surely this, in terms of extracting semen this, in a forced way, surely this is the least efficient way to do it. Like, if, you, if you're just going for nut, like, go in there with a syringe, right? 
You know, why why do you why do you have to hook them up to the fucking multiple orgasm machine? Dude, why am I even talking about this? This I want this podcast to be successful and monetized and make money and and the the what? The first 10 minutes of this show is me talking about the dick sucking machine and my ass. Uh, anyway, guys, support me on Patreon for the love of God, because that, that Lord knows that's the only way I'm going to get fucking paid. We lost Manscaped. It's dire times. Um, Peterson quote tweeted it, writing, such fun in unbelievable techno nightmare CCP hell. Yeah, bro. Absolutely unbelievable. You saw that shit and you fucking believed? <laughs> And hey, all you Jordan Peterson nerds writing up your fucking paragraphs in the comments. I saw the cunt live and I've read his books. Every now and then, all right, your favorite fucking intellectual man can say, can be can be a 50-year-old boomer online. All right, that's what he's done. The implication, it seems, is that the Chinese Communist Party is running dystopian bondage forced ejaculation clinics or something. Dude, sign me up for the forced ejacu- ejaculation clinics. I'll go. The tweet in Peterson's response instantly went viral. (laughs) And the original person who tweeted it wrote, Sorry, my mistake. I found this video on WeChat and they said this is China's collection room for sperm bank. Turns out this video is from UK. Okay, be honest, bro. It doesn't matter where it's from, all right, geographically. Tell me where it's actually from, please, so I can watch the video and sign up to their services. Oh, man, that is so funny. Oh, okay. Dude, guys. Fucking plot twist, all right? I didn't read the rest of the article, of course, because why would I read anything before I start talking about it on, on Spearhead Sundays? So what, you wanted, you wanted news? Is that what you came here for? Some sperm banks in China do use machines to help... help. <laughs> Some sperm banks in China do use machines to help people jerk off into cups. What have they got? The Riley Reed fucking fleshlight? But those look a lot more sterile. Oh, surely. And and are basically motorized fleshlights housed in plastic, not the Matrix green fetish milking room that they originally implied was an invention of the Chinese government. Hands-free sperm collecting machine goes viral online. Ah. That looks that looks like it would be fun. The Chinese I want to go to the Chinese sperm collect, collecting machine wall. Basically what it is it's like someone just a, attached a, a flashlight to a hole in the wall and 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 it just jerks you off. That seems fun. That seems like a good time. <laughs> that's so that is so funny. See, it doesn't and that's the problem with all of these intellectuals and and philosophers and, and and basically anyone whose job it is to be smart, that that's the problem with the internet because we've all fallen for dumb shit before. I mean, I've made a fucking video before that was just fake. I, I didn't know at the time, right? And I am the guy that exposes people for not fucking doing their research and journalists being dumb. I've done it, right? Everyone's fuck. Everyone listening to this has believed something told someone else about it and then and then they've gone you're an idiot dude that's not real and you go oh what's the dumbest thing I, I i believed i can't really remember let me know i would genuinely i'd love to know what dumb shit have you guys believed that was just so patently false oh i got sucked into covid conspiracies for a little bit in melbourne where uh when all flights were banned there were all of these flights coming in and out of china and I fell down this rabbit hole and I was like, oh my God, they're flying people in and out. Rich people are going in and out. This is, you know, they're, they're keeping us trapped here, but they haven't, it was cargo. They were moving things. <laughs> of course. Anyway. So I'm still waiting on my text from Zach Efron. From Zach Efron's mate, by the way, I would never, obviously. Now I'm getting a lot of comments from a lot of people, and I'm very upset about it. I'm getting a lot of comments and messages telling me that I'm never going to see my Zac Efron photo. And I've actually turned around on this, and I trust Zac Efron, okay? I met Zac Efron, and he was lovely, and I know that he wouldn't lie to me. He said that we should take a photo on his friend's phone, and then his friend will take my number down and text it to me. It's been exactly one week since that happened, and I'm still waiting. But I believe in Zac Efron. I think that I'm going to get my photo 
any day now. Now, granted, I can't message Zac Efron. Did, well, did I message Zac Efron? Yes, I did. I said, nice to meet you, dude. Now, he has 67 million followers on Instagram, and he's probably getting 67 million DMs every single minute. So my message, I already know, has been deleted despite my blue tick. Fine, okay? So that's whatever. That message is gone. Perhaps it was silly of me to even message in the first place, but he was a nice guy. And if there's one thing I'm going to do, it's network, okay? I'm the networking king. There's a reason why king is in the word networking, and it's because I'm in there, the king of networking, all right? None of you cunts could go to LA for two weeks and hang out with Joe Rogan. Me, I could do it the first time in my sleep, all right? If there's one thing I'm going to do, it's build bridges and help people out. Now, I believe that Zac Efron's friend is getting around to it. I think that at that any minute now, it could happen during this podcast. I'll check my phone. Nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing yet. But it's coming. It's on its way. And I, I thoroughly believe that. And if you don't have any faith in the Zac Efron photo, stop listening to the show. I don't need you as a fan. Because in this community, we believe in Zac Efron's friend. And there's no way that he would lie to me and manipulate me and make a mockery of me by, by acting out the photo interaction just to put it on his friend's phone that will then delete it later instead of sending it to me while they laugh about the the, the, the small Australian comedian who was opening for their friend they're in a movie with and his, his naive idea that he would ever get to post a photo with Zac Efron on his Instagram. I believe in Zac Efron. He was very lovely when I met him and there's no way he would lie. It's coming. A lot of and and you know what? Not everyone is 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 uh a person of little faith. Every single thing that I have posted since talking about this on the show, there's been at least three or four comments asking about the photo with Zac Efron and if I've received it yet. And keep it up. That's the type that's the type of faith that we need to have as because if you're a member of my community, you're a member of the Zach Efron community. You're a Zef head or whatever they call him, the Zephrons. Do they does he have a name? Doesn't matter. Whatever their name is, sign me up. <laughs> Guys, we are almost at 400 patrons. I think we're like 7 people away from 400 Patreon supporters. Sign the fuck up, okay? That would that would be great. We don't have we don't have manscaped anymore. All right, we're not touring like we used to, because we got and, and we've got and we've got surgeons to pay, and mortgages to to resume paying, because we've deferred those. So <laughs> <laughs> so Patreon dot com slash loose spears sign up you get an extra episode of the podcast every week and you get the podcast early. If I film it early, I'm recording on Thursday today, so you know you listen to this one early. Um, and the Patreon episode's up right now if you want to go get it. Now, uh, I uh, have been looking into what I would like to do next year because I have been uh, uh, purposely avoiding the thought of what I'm even going to do next month for since COVID started because it was too hurtful after a while. You know what I mean? Like during COVID when you were like, oh, well, we'll be, we'll be out next month and then I'll get to take that bike ride or then I'll get to open that business or then I'll get to fucking pay back my loan. And then, and then it's, it just got deferred and deferred and deferred. Well, then imagine after the COVID ended, you were then hit with like two years of surgery getting done and recovering and, and then doing so I've just not thought about anything past like fucking two or three weeks in my future because uh, after so many times of I'm going to do this and then the world going actually no you're not it became too hard so I was like I'm going to focus on what I'm doing today and maybe tomorrow morning but but looking into the afternoon 
fills me with too much dread. But now, all right, guess who's been working on themselves? Lewis Spears, okay? And we talk about that a little bit on Patreon. Uh, but, uh, it, but, but now, I because uh, basically this year, all I've kind of planned for is up until the surgery. I'm going to do my shows. I'm going to sell as many fucking tickets as I can. I'm going to make the show as amazing as it can be. And then we'll see where we're at when that's done. Maybe I'll tour. Maybe I'll just get the surgery. I don't know. All right. That's all that I've planned. But what I've decided to think about is next year. And I want to get the fuck out of this country because there is, uh, I have hit the ceiling and my head hurts. All right. Now, I'm, not, I'm just talking career ceiling in Australia. Skill-wise, I've got a lot more to go, but I do think there's a skill ceiling here as well for stand-up because we have one club in Melbourne. We've got one club in Melbourne. We've got one in Sydney. We've got one in Perth. We've got uh, two in Adelaide, all right? It's not enough clubs, okay? I need to be performing at clubs like fucking multiple times a night every single night, all right, for, to really get good. So that's where I'm at. So I'm like, okay, where can I move that has those clubs? My options are uh, any city in America, but let's say New York, uh, London in UK, and uh, Canada. Somewhere in Canada probably has a big scene. I haven't looked too much into Canada, but it's part of the Commonwealth. Easy to move to. All right. New York, uh, impossible until I get a visa. That's its whole immigration lawyer process. That's a lot of money. That's a big hassle. So that's not something I can, that I can definitely do. So that's out for now. That's the ultimate goal in the future, but that's out. Uh, London and Canada. I don't know anything about Canada. I don't know anybody in Canada. Uh, and I don't know the scene at all. Okay. So that I need to do more research, but probably not Canada. We're looking at London. All right. Now you guys know me. I'm the man with the plan. I've uh, ever since I fucking started, right? When I started stand up in like 2014, I was like, I'm going to do a comedy special and I'm going to crowdfund it. And I did that shit all the way up to 2019, did a TV pilot, went to the US, and now, and then I didn't think about even next week for fucking three years. And now we're here, four years. So now I'm starting to think about, okay, well, what's going to be the next five years of what this is, okay? Because I want to be a fucking great. I want to I wanna fucking really do this thing, for real. I want to be uh, Jim Jeffries digital era, right? That's what I want to do. I want to do what he did. I love what fucking, uh, you know, Jim Jeffries has done. People like Adam Hills. Uh, who else has made it uh, out of Australia? There's, fuck, the list is small. Uh, there's, a, there's a woman called, what's her fucking name? South African woman. She lives in New Zealand, but that still counts. Uh, people like, Hannah Gadsby, uh, I don't give a fuck what you think about her comedy. She fucking made it from here. I'm impressed. <laughs> I want to do that, basically. So I'm like, okay, I need to get out of here. I need to be in a place with clubs. So I go London, all right? London has uh, the highest amount of clubs per capita than any city in the world, apparently. And I know people in London. I know Alex from England and a bunch of other YouTubers and shit. Perfect, okay? So I start looking and moving to London. It's pretty easy because they're part of the Commonwealth. I reckon I can get out there next year, fucking uproot everything, just leave, all right? And start again in a place that actually has a comedy industry that isn't just a comedy festival that it, with a gala once a year, you know? And then, and then otherwise you can perform in RSLs to your own fans, not to anyone else, <laughs> if you can sell the tickets, right? Which I'm blessed to be able to do, but it's not how you write new shows, you know? So I look up into moving to London <clears throat> and it's pretty straightforward. It's difficult, but it's possible. And I go, cool. Well, I reckon I'm going to set my sights on London. Now, how do I get the dog over there? And I look into, because uh, I've looked into moving the dog, Bobby, over to uh, New York. Easy as, right? You just pay a bunch of money. They put her in a crate. The 60 to 70% chance she dies in the cargo. All good, right? I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, but but kind of not. Uh, <laughs> look, give her some Valium. She'll be right. Um, anyway, looking at London. And, dude, they have this law where they outlawed dangerous dog breeds. Uh, and the dog breeds were like um, pit bulls. Uh, those, those Akita things, uh, 
some type of mastiff, like dogs I hadn't really heard of before, like pit bulls I've heard of, but then like so, some other dogs and I Googled them and they were like, uh, yeah, this dog is for killing bears and humans. And I was like, oh yeah, fair enough. Uh, and then I was like, oh, well, she's none of those. She's an American Staffy. Uh, and then they go, or uh, dogs that look like any of these breeds according to whoever looks at them. That's the law, all right? Now, she is none of the dangerous breeds, but if you look at her and you're not a very good person with dogs, you're going to look at her and see a pit bull, all right? She's a lovely, sweet girl, but if you look at her, you're going to see a beast, all right? And here's what happens, okay? So it's completely subjective. They wouldn't be able to go, oh, she looks like a pit bull, and then I pull out my papers of her DNA test and go, actually, she's this, this, and this. She's not pit bull. And then they go, oh, my mistake. She can come in. Here's what happens, right? If they, if, if a person subjectively determines that your dog looks like one of the banned breeds or has some characteristics physically of the banned breeds, what happens is they take your dog and they kill it. Or this is your other option. You have two options. Either you give us the dog and we kill it, right? This is at the airport, by the way. Imagine me. I walk in. I'm like, brand new start. Got my dog. Got my fucking hope, my future. And they and, and then one guy who, who doesn't have dogs at home, he's like a cat person, looks at her and goes, that's a pit bull. And I go, no, actually, uh, American Staffy, we've got our papers. Here you go. She's also lovely. Give her a pat. And he goes, I don't want to give her a pat. That looks scary. And then I go, well, I well, well she's not. And I can prove that with, with a DNA test. And he goes, yeah, well, she looks scary. So your options are this. Either I'll take her right now and fucking kill her at the back in the car park with a shovel, or uh, we can fight over it in court. And uh, if you, if I win, I kill the dog anyway. And then you also get charged with, with possessing a dangerous dog and you go to prison. Or if you win... They then have to pass a behavioral test. If they fail, they die. If they pass, you can only work, walk it in certain times. She has a curfew and she has to wear these for the rest of her life. And then also if a, if a police officer sees her and sees she's a scary dog, the process starts all over again. Those are your options. Literally, right, beyond parity, this is London. This is the UK right now. All right. Do you have a license for that dog, mate? You need a fucking license to watch the television in that country? You need a fucking license to have a dog that looks like it could be maybe a dangerous breed according to a police officer that's not a dog per expert or person or a fucking immigration guy at the airport gate? And here's the thing. Say I pull up with her going, oh, well, I don't think she looks like a pit bull because I don't think that. All right, but I understand that other people may. I go, well, I don't think she looks like a pit bull, so I'm going to take her to the gate. I'm going to take her to London, and we'll see if she passes, right? So here's what would happen. Take her there, and, and then someone would go, oh, she looks like a dangerous dog. I, and I could go, okay, well, it was worth a shot. I'll take her back to Australia. They go, nah, -uh, I want to kill her right now. And I go, well, I can just take her back. No worries. I thought I would just test. There's no way to test it, right? And this rule is not just for people bringing dogs into the country. It's for every single person who lives in that country. So imagine you've had your dog for 10 years. It's a legal breed, right? Pitbull, one of these banned breeds, or one of these dogs that looks like they have some characteristics according to someone's subjective opinion, this is like even an English staffy could get this because they've got the big like pit bull shaped head on a little body. So they could, someone could look at them, a neighbor could call them, the police and go, oh, there's a dangerous dog, come get it. And then this is a dog that you've had for 10 years that previously was legal. They could just take it and kill it in front of your kids. That's insane. So London is now... Not looking so great. A lot of a lot of Canucks are listening to this. All fucking seven of you going, oh, this is good, eh? Oh, gee, maybe Lewis Spears will be moving to Canada. I don't know how you guys speak, but I know you say guys say a sometimes, and you sound American, but you kind of don't. Look, 
It's looking like London for me, and then maybe I could stay there for like six months or a year and then and then get out. The ultimate goal is New York. If I can get an immigration lawyer to say, yes, this guy is, is famous, he qualifies for an O-1A visa, an extraordinary talent visa, he's in. But until then, it'll be London. You got a license for that dog? You got to fucking pay for a license to watch the television in your own house. So anyway, guys, that's why you should support me on Patreon because, man, I need to bribe some immigration officials to get my dog across the border. That's a crazy. Um, what an injustice. My poor Pibble. <laughs> any English people have any thoughts that listen to the show? That literally is, uh, is going to stop me from moving to London. Fuck. Anyway, guys. Uh, what else did I want to talk about here? I've got uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Zach Evron. Um, oh, man. My girl and me, right, we, uh, we're not, we're, we, we, we like watching movies together, but we don't, we don't, we, we don't really like scary movies. But, but every now and then the, the planets will align and both of us will be in like a, a thriller mood. We don't like scary. We don't like horror. We like thriller. So something that, that will give me a little jolt of suspense but isn't going to fucking make me piss my pants. Because here's the thing. One time we watched a horror film, okay? We watched um, it was one of the James Wan films. Uh, and it was like a Jewish uh, uh, themed James Wan Jewish uh, scary movie about a box. What was it called? Uh, the Conjuring. We watched The Conjuring, right? Because, and this is my first ever like proper scary movie that I decided to watch. Never really watched one before. And I started off, both of us, she'd never watched one either. Both of us started off with one of the scariest movies that were out at the time. I think it was like a year after it came out. We watched just one of the scariest movies that is, that's ever been made. And what's bad about that is I, I, from memory, I can't even really remember it. It was so scary. That film was was in someone else's house, right? And when we watched it, we were house sitting in someone else's house, right? So we watched it and then we watched the whole thing and then neither of us slept because we were there for a week. We didn't sleep for two days without waking up scared at some point in the night. And from then, we swore off horror films. Can't do them. I can do thriller. I can do uh, suspense. I cannot do horror. I watched it. Stephen King, great. Has like a couple jump scares. It's not terrifying, right? And in particular, I can't really do like, uh, I can't really do ghost or spiritual or religious. For whatever reason, those scare me much more because they because they seem more real or something. I don't know. They scare me. All right. But my girls are same, if not worse. The other day we got into a scary movie mood, right? And we thought, well, let's just pick something like a thriller. All right. Nothing too scary. We'll just pick something because we like going in blind. I don't, I hate watching trailers because trailers give everything away. Uh, I don't like watching trailers. Uh, and uh, um, what did we watch? We load up this film. We, we have a look at the poster and we go, oh, yeah, uh, this looks kind of spooky, but not really. And we chuck it on and it's, we turn all the lights off, okay, because that's how, you, that's how you turn a thriller into an almost horror, all right? That's perfect for me. I don't want a horror. I'll watch a thriller with the lights off. That's as scary as I go. And we picked this film that we've never heard of called Sinister. We have not slept properly since. And we watched that weeks ago. We sleep with the light on now. We finished the entire movie. Both of us 
way too fucking scared to ask the other one if they would like to stop watching, thinking that the other one wasn't as scared as they were feeling right now, when in reality, both of us were shitting our pants from the moment the movie started to its end. The entire time. And afterwards, we look at each other and I go, holy fuck, that was so scary. And then the wind blows and both of us jump. She yelps, I jump, and then that sets off the dog who's currently on fucking Prozac, so I don't know how it scared her. The dog was scared listening to the sound effects. We shouldn't have watched that shit. And then I go, what the fuck did we just watch? I Google it, and it is scientifically proven to be the scariest film ever made. (laughs) We go, oh yeah, this looks like a fun little thriller to give us a little bit of uh, adrenaline, maybe a jump scare here or there. We watch scientifically the scariest movie ever made in the history of film. And I'm still not over. It's been a couple of weeks. I am scared. I sleep with a light on. Oh my God. Don't watch in Sinister. It's spooky as fuck. Bro, I didn't, we, I'm never watching a a thriller without Googling it first. I won't watch the trailer, but I will look up on Reddit how scary is this film. Dude, it's this film about uh, this writer who does true crime and he had one hit book where he actually uncovered like a lot of uh, mysterious stuff. Uh, or actually uncovered a lot of uh, uh, unknown things and and literally solved a cold case, becomes incredibly famous. But then, like, one of his next books, he does the opposite. He fucks up and he discovers a bunch of, bunch of false information, makes the whole thing worse. So he has this giant rise and then a big crash and burn, and then this next book to solve this group of this murders, uh, he it's like everything's hinging on it, and he kind of throws it caution to the wind and dives into this case to the point where he rents the house where this family was murdered to try and solve the case. And he keeps that a secret from his wife and kids. Uh, And then spooky things start happening. And uh, all of a sudden, all of these other murders are connected to it. uh, And this thing starts uh, unraveling and he's right, trying to write his book the whole time and his family are in the dark, but he knows. uh, And it just gets scarier and scarier and scarier and scarier and it has one of the one of the most fucked terrifying loud and genuinely scary jump scares i've ever seen and and probably ever will see because again it was scientifically the scariest movie ever made and i'm still upset <laughs> So if you want to fucking piss your pants, watch Sinister. It's terrible. Um, All right. Let's get into miscellaneous bit of the end. If you guys don't know, that's the part of the podcast where I answer emails sent in by you, the listener. Send your email to podcast at lewspears.com, L-E-W-spears.com. Life advice, a funny story you want to tell me, a question uh, about me or my life, send them through to uh, podcast at lewspears.com or if you want me to, to give my opinion on, on a topic or anything uh, like that. So we've got this message. I started cheerleading because of a dare. Hey, Lewis, bit of background. When I, st- when I started, I was 20 and studying at uni in Melbourne. Now, I'm not a small bloke. I'm 194 centimetres. What's that, 6'6 six, six, six or 7? Uh, not as tall as you, you beast, but I tower over anyone else at cheer. Yeah, you, you're fucking huge, man. A girl in my class is a cheerleader and dared me to come out and try out as a joke. This is at the start of September last year. I thought about it for a few days and I decided that it would be a good story no matter what happened. That is a brilliant attitude to have about your life is when someone offers you to do something, just say yeah. Uh, 
even if you think you're not going to like it, an activity. Uh, this this rule that doesn't work so much when it's when it's uh, uh, an offer of uh, sexual activity because then you, you're consenting to things you don't want. So I, I would take it with a grain of salt. But generally, when it's like hobbies or interests or activities, always say yes to things that even if you think it's going to be lame because worst case scenario, uh, you'll die. Second worst case scenario, you'll have a cool story to tell. Um to my surprise, cheerleading is a very difficult sport. Anyway, I loved it and I had so much fun. After the triad, I was invited out to dinner after training by the team. So as you can see, I was having a great day. Skip forward three months and I'm on the Gold Coast competing at national. Sick. We came sixth out of all the unis in Australia. Is that good? Uh, here I was three months after starting cheer as a joke on the Gold Coast with a team of cheerleaders. And not only that, it was also a dance competition as well. So there were about 60 to 70 of us staying in the hotel. I had a good week to stay the least. Yeah, buddy. Dude, one of the fucking tallest dudes in the hotel, 60 to 70 dancers and cheerleaders. Let's fucking go. Where are we going? To pussy down. I haven't even gotten to the craziest part yet. When we got home, I was asked if I would try out for an all-star team with one of the cheerleaders from uni. Dude, I didn't even know Australia had cheerleading thing. I thought it was like an exclusively American thing. So I try out to support her and I got on the team. This guy's such an ally. For a bit of context, cheerleading has levels one to seven, seven being the highest level. Uh, the level determines the stunts that are allowed. The uni team I was on was level one to two. I got onto the all-star level three team. Oh, so halfway to the top. So now I am on the all-star team. This team has a trip to Hawaii in May and Brisbane later in the year. I'm also still a part of the uni team, but to my surprise, I was moved up to the level three to four team. I've gone from this time last year, not knowing anything about cheerleading to training five nights a week while also studying and being an environmental engineer. That is amazing, dude. See, that is the power of like saying... Uh, yes, to like spontaneity, dude. Like that's a really, really important part of life. And that's something that, that honestly I've written most of my really best jokes or stories or podcast tales have come from me saying yes to an activity. Uh, I just, I, even an activity that I, that I knew that I wouldn't like, you know, I used to, if you guys remember years ago, if you saw me years ago, I, I did a really good bit about cruise ships. Uh, and that's because uh, Jazz and I went on a cruise holiday. And, and it's, it's something that I kind of knew that I wouldn't even really like, but I just decided to do it so that, you know, I could just do it. And and I would I would come home with a story about it or an experience, or maybe it would turn out that I actually would like it. Same thing with this dude. This guy's like cheerleading. I don't want to be a fucking cheerleader. Next thing you know, he's flying to fucking Hawaii. Um. <clears throat> I'm training five nights a week while also studying and being an environmental engineer. How do you recommend balancing my life so I don't burn myself out but can still afford the life that I'm living? I don't even have a passport. Well, firstly, start your passport application if you need to go go to Hawaii. Those passports, they take a long time. You need to start that. Ugh, I need to renew mine. Mine expired. I need, I need to do that, actually. Take my own advice. Um how do you recommend balancing my life so I don't burn myself out? Okay, so when you are like uh, an elite person or, you, or or you're trying to be, right? Whether whether you're a, uh, a level of success of, of, of the elite in terms of athlete or entertainment or whatever you're doing, if you want to be an elite person, regardless of the, of the fact whether you are elite or not, skill-wise, success-wise, career-wise, you need to act as if you are. Um, and and an, an elite person, right? A person who's like at the top of their field or doing really, really well uh, needs to be doing two things always. Uh, the first thing is striving. So that's like, you know, in your case, working out, eating properly, doing all of the things that, that move your body, uh, make yourself work so that you can earn money to support the diet that you have or all of the other bullshit. I don't know anything about cheer, all right? D don't fuck any of the girls that are on your team. Stick to girls that are on other teams, rival teams even. Fuck them so hard they can't perform. Um, <laughs> consensually. Uh, you should be doing, yeah, striving, right, is the first thing. The second thing, you should be rejuvenating. And that's a big thing that, that a lot of people don't do, and including me, right? You should be striving and rejuvenating. You should always be doing things that advance yourself, your career, your skill set, your diet, your, you know, your way of life that benefits your chosen skill or career or whatever you're doing, right? Practicing music, 
fucking reading books that inspire your next novel or doing research to cure the disease or whatever you're doing, striving, those are the important thing. But most people only do this. Most people only do the striving bit and that's how you burn out, right? Speaking from personal experience, okay? Uh, you need, this is as important, all right? As important as the striving part, the rejuvenating part. You need to do things that replenish you that are not your work, that are not your, you know, your, your shit, that are not like uh, mindless things, like scrolling through your phone is not resting. Uh, binge watching a TV show is not like, if that's the only thing you do in your downtime, that's not resting. Obviously watching TV and stuff is fine, but if that's the only thing that you do, you're not actually rejuvenating yourself. And that is, is as important, if not more than the actual striving bit, because if you don't refill your cup, you end up burning out. And then guess what? You can't do the striving thing. This happened to me, right? My circumstance is a little bit better because my my home life was 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 very chaotic. We were fostering a kid and, and 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 I was like healing from a surgery and I had another surgery coming up and and all of that kind of stuff. Like I didn't uh, have the time to rejuvenate myself and look after myself and uh, and look after my mind and my body and and uh, and give myself enough energy to go back into strive mode. Uh, and and that's really my biggest advice. Even fucking Mr. Beast talks about this of you know, the trap to fall into is like, oh, I'm always hustling. I'm always waking up early. Sometimes you literally need to do fucking nothing for an entire day go to other than going for a walk or going out by yourself or turning your phone off and just leaving the house and doing something on a weekend. Um, so that's, that's how I would, what I would really advise to you is, and it's really, really hard, especially when Again, speaking from experience, when uh, you have uh, this skill and this dream, but it's not making you any money. So you have to also have this job uh, that, you know, you don't want, but it fuels the dream. So you essentially have two full-time jobs, right? And one of them's a lot harder than the other one, the boring one that you don't want, but you need that one uh, to keep everything spinning. And it's difficult, but it is very possible. Even if it's like waking up fucking... 15 minutes earlier so that you can go on a 10 minute walk, five minutes to put your shoes on and get dressed, 10 minutes to walk around, five minutes to have a shower afterwards and just walk around during the day and just think no phone, no music, no nothing, just to have a think. Uh, reading books is great. Journaling is amazing. I've only recently started doing journaling and I've been doing it for, uh, seven weeks in a row. I've only missed two days. I write three pages every single day. I've only missed two days in two months and it's changed my fucking life. And it's really, really, really helping me. It's helping me, uh, you know, align my thoughts and plan out my day and get all of this garbage that's floating around in your head that could be cleared with, it doesn't have to be journaling. It could be meditation. It could be physical exercise. It could be running or swimming or walking or whatever the fuck it is, do it and, and don't feel guilty about it. Because that's another thing. If you're sitting there, you know, reading a book, trying to fucking relax, but you're feeling guilty about not striving, that's not rejuvenating. That's actually procrastinating rejuvenating. You're procrastinating on your responsibility to do fucking nothing. That's really important. Because if you don't do it, you'll guess what will happen? You'll be forced to. Like me, you fucking explode and you can't do anything. And I disappeared for three months. And, I, and you know what I did? I caught up on my debt. Of, of rejuvenation. I caught up on it. I couldn't do anything. All I did was fucking sit in bed and read and go for walks and take myself to gym. I did nothing because I couldn't do anything because for fucking, I reckon 18 months before that, I didn't have a day or an hour or a fucking 30 minutes where I did nothing, where I just thought about my life or thought about you know, doing something or cook myself a nice meal or, you know, I did, I did none of it for 18 months because I was sick and there was stuff at home and all this kind of shit. And, and guess what? I paid for it. I worked up a debt. So that's my advice to you, man, is it's super tough. I've been there where you have this, this dream and you have all these opportunities, but you also have this fucking job. And then you also have this uh, fucking uni thing. I mean, that was sounds similar to me. I wasn't studying, but I had uh, a regular job, but then I also had this stand-up thing that I was trying to do that I was trying to get good at. But then I also had the YouTube thing, 
the online thing and the stand up and online and stand up, they're two different jobs. So I had three jobs too. And it's tough, but it's possible. But you have to look after yourself and you have to rejuvenate and you have to take that as a responsibility to yourself and understand that relaxing and rejuvenating, that is that is actually part of striving and achieving and and doing good and being well. Because if you don't do it, you'll be forced to. And also if you don't do it, even if you don't have a giant like fucking breakdown, what will happen is you'll start making dumb decisions. You know, when you're on cheer, if you, I mean, you know, this, you're like a physical athlete. If you don't look after your body and if you don't have rest time, you're going to injure yourself and then you won't be able to do it. Or you're going to fucking have weak muscles because you didn't look after your body because you didn't rest. Right. So you're going to throw some chick the wrong way. She's going to land on her head. Next thing you know, instead of doing star jumps, she's drooling. (laughs) So that's my advice. Is you need to rejuvenate. That goes for everyone, no matter even if you don't have a fucking dream. But that goes for everyone, especially if you have a dream that you're really striving for, which you should. Even if your dream is to just be a good person, you gotta fucking look after yourself, and you gotta rejuvenate, and you gotta uh, uh, do that. And and if you want to be an elite, you know, like I do, you gotta live your life as if you are already, because you are who you will become. Uh, and if you're a person who fucking sits there procrastinating, doing fuck all, eating like garbage, guess what? That's who you're going to be. Um, and uh, that's where I'm going to end it. Uh, if you want more podcast, I'm going to continue on right now for uh, the Patreon version. We are seven people away from 400 patrons. I would love for you to sign up. I want to see you in Melbourne, loosebeers.com for your tickets. Uh, it's two weeks away until the brand new show. This These might be the only shows that I do all year in any city. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to tour. It's looking like I probably won't. So these are going to be maybe the only shows that I do. That may change. I don't know. But it's definitely going to be the only Melbourne shows. So if you want to see me in Melbourne, loosebeers.com. Get your tickets now. uh, And I'll talk to you next Sunday. I'll see you over on Patreon right now. And I hope you have a shit one. Bye.